Hello friends, welcome again to the Three Messengers television channel. You know, we have gone through the Protestant Reformation. Our, our presentation today, our presentation today is about the, the ad adversaries, the, the enemies of the Protestant Reformation. Because when, the, when Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis on the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany in 1517, beginning with intensity, the Protestant Reformation so much that he has been looked at as the father of the Protestant Reformation. He received opposition from the Church of Rome. He received opposition from the papacy. He received house arrest. He received banishment. He received an inquisition but he refused to recant his beliefs against indulgences and payment for the forgiveness of sins and the veneration and worshiping of the saints that were promoted by the church, by the Roman church to which he was a priest, a church at which he later left and got married, you know, he no longer believed in celibacy. It was not a requirement of his salvation. You know, so here Martin Luther began with intensity, the continuation of the Protestant Reformation that began before him. For over 25 years, spanning the reign of three popes of the Roman Catholic Church. Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and now Pope Francis, the Roman Catholic Church has apologized for a number of very unchristian activities for which the Church had been involved for centuries. Such as the Crusades and persecution and killing of Protestant believers, the Church's complicity with Nazi Germany as they did in Holocaust of the Jewish people during Hitler's Germany. With the Allied Forces the Rwandan genocide in which priests and bishops were involved, even orchestrated and issued weapons for two warring tribes, the Tutsis and the Hutus to slaughter each other by the hundreds of thousands. Almost a million people died. The Church's role in many atrocities throughout history including the discoveries of mass graves of young children at Catholic-run boarding schools in Canada. And the United States, which prompted a recent apology by Pope Francis, is the evidence that this Church will not change. Their attitude and posture is still one of arrogance. The recent upheaval of pedophilia within the Church internationally shows that the Church still has not changed and still has an antichrist culture. Nothing really concrete has been done to bring many of the pedophiles within Church ranks and clergy to face true justice. This we believe is due to the influence and power of the Church with judicial and political powers in the United States and prominent countries of the world. The Bible in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 admonishes us. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues.
So there was a counter-reformation formed. And this counter-reformation was sponsored by the Jesuit order of the priesthood of the Catholic Church. The Jesuit order was founded by Saint Ignatius, so-called saint. I don't think he was a saint, but you know, that's a title that he, he received. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, 1534, the founder of the Jesuit order. And the Jesuit order was a counter-revolutionary force that was designed to counter and to sabotage and to destroy the Protestant Reformation. It is very important to know that our present Pope, the present Pope rather, not ours, the present Pope of Rome, Pope Francis, is a member of the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order was scorned when they became prominent at the time of the Pro Protestant Re Reformation, many world leaders expelled them from their territory because of the, the, their, their criminal activities, because of nothing that they, and no level that they would have stooped to preserve the false doctrines and teachings of, of the Church of Rome. So, you know, let us, but, you know, before we go in more detail about the, 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 the adversaries of the Protestant Re Reformation, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for, on this your Holy Sabbath day, for the opportunity to share your gospel and to disclose and to proclaim the truth of the Protestant Reformation. We pray for the forgiveness of all our sins and we hope, Lord, and pray that you will open our understanding of these important points that we should know and should prepare as we go forward into the time of the end. Forgive us of all our sins, I pray, and help us, Lord, to understand that the forces against us, the forces of darkness are many as your saints. But let us also understand that the powers that are for us, Lord, which is your almighty power, is more powerful than the powers that are against us, is more, is, 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 is more, is much stronger is much more established, is much more influ influential than the powers that, that seek to destroy the Pro Protestant Reformation. So help us to continue this process in your name is my prayer in none other than Jesus' name, amen. You know, we are aware that kings could not be appointed without the approval of the Pope of Rome during the Holy Roman Empire. So France, Germany, Britain, or England, the Netherlands, Poland, you name it, all came on, under the control of the Holy Roman Empire. And there were no kings or queens that were appointed without the approval of the Pope of Rome. There was no approval granted that 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 Pope, that that king, that that queen, that leader of a, of, the, of a nation could not be appointed without the approval of all who dwell within the Holy Roman Empire. Because for 
1260 years, the Holy Roman Empire reigned a reign of terror with crusades, with Charlemagne and other people to go out and to seek the heretics and to convert by force those who were heretics or heretics as some people pronounce it, you know, in, in, in other dialects. As heretics. I say heretics, you know. But, you know, these mercenaries who were known as the Jesuits sought the demise and the destruction of the Protestant Reformation. You know, at the time of the Reformation, the Holy Roman Empire that had papal control over the kings of Europe were enforcers of Catholic doctrine. And as in France and Spain, persecuted dissenters and would bring them before tribunals. But the chief architect of the Counter-Reformation was Saint Ignatius of Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuit order. They were the intelligentsia and secret spies of the Vatican, whose, whose method of dealing with the centers was secret torture, assassinations, and all manner of gory lethal methods of silencing those who do not share in their blasphemous views, opinions, and doctrines. They were established to destroy Protestant Protestantism and its bearers. That was their purpose, the purpose of, of the Jesuit order to have been established by Ignatius of Loyola in 1534. The Encyclopedia Britannica gives a summary of the Protestant Reformation and the heart of the of contention between the Roman Catholic Church and the reformers. The Encyclopedia Britannica online stated, Reformation, also called the Protestant Reformation, is the religious re revolution that took place in the Western Church in the 16th century. Its greatest leaders undoubtedly were Martin Luther and John Calvin, having far-reaching political, economic, and social effect the Reformation became the basis of the founding of Protestantism, one of the three major branches of Christianity. The world of the late medieval Roman Catholic Church from which the 16th century reformers emerged was a complex one. Over the centuries, the church, particularly the office of the papacy, had become deep, deeply involved in the political life of Western Europe. So just as the 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 the, uh, the papacy under the, the, the with their mercenaries and with their 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 influencers in the form of the Jesuits sought influence in government in with kings and leaders of the world at, at the time of the Protestant Reformation. So so do, do they seek control of the world and influence in the halls of Congress of the United States in, in, with, with its leaders and, and also in other countries, especially the most prominent and powerful countries around the world, around the globe. As I speak of around the globe, let me welcome those within the United States and those within the, the, the continent of Africa, the countries of Mozambique, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, all those who from those countries who are engaged in conversation with me online from time to time. The African countries are so numerous that I've, I've lost touch of so many different pe people, so many different pastors and persons who wish to inquire about this great message. So please keep in touch with me. 
and let us form an alliance to spread the gospel, the good news to throughout the world. But, uh, you know, let me also thank you all, both locally in the United States and, and in, in Asia, in Pakistan, in India, and all those who see, have sought to and inquired regarding this, this great message. And, um, you know, just to, 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 to be in a position, as it were, to mention them that I really appreciate your friendship. I really appreciate your conversations. I really appreciate your subscriptions and likes and sharing and sharing this great uh, channel with friends and neighbors. So thank you very much for your engagements online and on the Tree Messengers television channel. You know, so having, you know, the far-reaching far economic and social effects, the Reformation became the basis of the founding of Protestantism, one of the three major branches of Christianity. So there are many churches that had belonged to the Protestant Reformation in those days, like such as the Lutheran Church, you know, which, you know, based on the name Martin Luther and his movement within Europe with the foundation of the Lutheran Church, the Anglican Church, you know, the Dutch Re Church, Reformed Church, and others, who, 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 the, 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 uh, many other ch denominations that were a part, that were had formed in Europe, the Church of Scotland and so forth, with John Knox, John Knox being a pioneer of the, the Protestant Reformation in Scotland. So, you know, we appreciate, uh, you know, people like Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus, within the Dutch church who sought reformation, within the Dutch church who fall, sought reformation. Erasmus was quite a, a great influence on Martin Luther. So the world of the late medieval Catholic church from the 16th century reformers emerged was a complex one. Over the centuries, the church, particularly in the office of the papacy, had become deeply involved in the political life of Western Europe. The resulting intrigues and political manipulations combined with the church's increasing power and wealth, contributing to the bankrupting of the church as a spiritual force. So even though the church became rich in monetary value, and, eco and its economic status. It became weak and bankrupt in terms of, of spiritual truths. So this is something to look at. Contributing to the bankrupting of the church as a spiritual force. Abuses such as indulgences, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, or spiritual privileges by the clergy and other charges of corruption undermines the church spiritual authority, undermine the church's spiritual authority. So because the church was so caught up in making money, in scamming the believers, of talking about selling certificates of indulgences for past, present, and future sin. The church was concentrated on that. And Martin Luther was caught up in that. And some of his believers demanded that they receive forgiveness, you know, for the indul through the, the indulgences that they paid for. And Martin Luther re re refused to give them that, that forgiveness of sin and told them to go and seek forgiveness from the Lord. Because the Lord is our only mediator. There is only one mediator, according to the scriptures, between man and God, and that's the man Christ Jesus. 
Jesus is our only mediator, not your, your, your pastor, not your bishop, your cardinal, your priest, or the pope. Your only mediator between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. You know, the encyclopedia is an independent source of information and has given a condensed and, and concise definition, you know, which I've expressed before. You know, according to the, prof, the, the prophetess and author, Ellen G. White, in her book, The Great Controversy, Witness Montanus, Novatian, Donatus, Paulicians, Constantine of Armenia, Claude of the Abigenses, Waldo of the Waldenses, Hassan Gerona of Bohemia, and at the climax also were to appear Luther, Melanchthon, Zwingli, and their numerous associates. So those are some names of the great fathers of the Protestant, Protestant Reformation. At no time in those 15 centuries was the, the savior of men without true witnesses to the saving power of the gospel. God did not leave the saints without leadership, without vision, a vision throughout the centuries of the Protestant Reformation. Because it is believed that, that from the early 5th century to, to, to 1789, a period of 1200 and approximately 1260 years, there was darkness in the church and the Protestant Reformation in the Roman church, that is. And the Pro Protestant Reformation made it possible between those years for the free and true proclamation of the gospel. The Jesuit became so nefarious, so, so you could say they became so notorious rather, they became more notorious that governments sought to expel them. They were gotten so dangerous that the governments of, 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 of Europe sought to expel them from their territories. The Portuguese crown, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Portuguese crown expelled the Jesuits in 1759. France made them illegal in 1764. And Spain and the kingdom of the two Sicilies, at one time the Sicilies were divided in two kingdoms. And they took other repressive action against the Jesuits in 1767. Opponents of the Society of Jesus, or known as the Jesuits, achieved their greatest success when they took their case to Rome. You know, but although Pope Clement VIII refused to act against the Jesuits, reportedly stating that they should be as they are and or be not at all. His successor, Clement, who reigned between 1769 to, to, to 74, whose election was urged by anti-Jesuit forces, issued a brief, Dominus Ac Redemptor, Lord of the Redeemer, which suppressed the society of the Jesuits for good, for the good of the church. So here even a pope, even one of the popes was opposed to the Jesuits because they consider them as dangerous people and bad for the reputation of the Roman Catholic Church. So, so you know, in the, but in the university of P Princeton University, that is, I published a document and it gives an account of President John Adams President John Adams actually was opposed to the Jesuits because he knows that they are conniving, that they are scheming, and that they hated the Constitution of the United States, that they hated the freedom of vote, freedom of, to vote, 
freedom of speech and freedom of expression. He knew that they were dangerous to be in the United States. And this is what it, you know, President John Adams thought about the Jesuits, American Jesuits and the world. This is, this is the, the title of this document that was released by, uh, by Princeton University. He, John Adams, he said that, that spread, I think he was the second president, if I'm not mistaken, of the United States. He said, I do not like the late resurrection of the Jesuits. The Jesuits had actually received, they had actually received recognition again. They had actually were able to come out of, of seclusion. They were able to come out of, you know, the, 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 the permanent banning of, the, of, of, of Pope Clement of them from the, the Catholic Church and from Catholic territory. They had arisen to prominence again by the formation of the United States of America. So President John Adams had expressed an opinion about the Jesuits at that time. And this is what he said. They have, I do not like the late resurrection of the Jesuits. They have a general now in Russia in correspondence with the Jesuits in the U.S., who are now numerous than everybody knows. Shall we not have swarms of them here? If ever any congregation of men could merit eternal perdition on earth and hell, it is this company of Loyola. That's what President John Adams, the second president of the United States, that is what he said about the Jesuits. They are a dangerous organization. And you know, because in Revelation 13, the leopard beast, which symbolizes this great power of Rome, with seven heads and ten horns, with ten crowns upon those horns, symbolizes Europe being dominated by the Holy Roman Empire and the crowns on those the horns of that leopard beast of Revelation 30, which is a spotted beast because the leopard cannot change its spots. And those, for those reasons, that leopard beast, which represents that, 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 that the papacy and the kingdom uh, and the influence rather of the Holy Roman Empire is the very, is very same as it was then, is same as it is today. It's the same power, having the same doctrines, practicing the same indulgences that the, 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 the Protestant Ref Reformation had, had opposed, opposing the worshiping of, of, of the saints, opposing the co-equal status of Mary and Jesus Christ, where Mary is looked on and venerated as a type of God, where prayers are being offered to Mary and the dead saints. You know, those kind of doctrines were in opposition to the teachings of the Protestant Reformation. And because the same type of scheming, the same type of, of, of spying, and the same kind, kind of of, uh, you could say, sabotage that went on against the, the Protestant Reformation existed then because the, 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 the power of the and influence of the papacy is like unto a leopard beast that changed not its spots, that influence and, and also intentions exist the same way today because Rome will never change. Rome is not gonna change. You know, the incidents of pedophilia, the incidents of, of, of even the, 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 the church's involvement in slavery and the apologies of the Pope for 
the church's involvement in slavery. The apologies for the popes for the church's involvement are the apologies of the pope for the church's involvement in the Rwandan genocide where almost a million, one million Rwandan, Tutsis and Hutu were massacred, were slaughtered with the involvement of, 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 of priests and bishops of the Catholic Church in Rwanda is really very telling that because that has happened while Bill Clinton was in, was in office as president. So that in, in situation took place quite recently while I, you know, was, I'm alive. While in my time and in, in many people's time, you know, in this modern era, I have lived to see a massacre orchestrated by the church in Rwanda with the massacre of almost a million people. And, and the Pope has sought forgiveness for the church and asking forgiveness. So I am drawing comparisons between the time of the Protestant Reformation and the Holy Roman Empire to nowadays, to today, to show you, to indicate to you that, that, that the Roman church has not changed and never will change till God re return. Their intention is to bring the world into papal domination, to be subject to papal domination, as was in the time of the Protestant Reformation as was in the time of the Protestant Reformation. It's the same ambitions that the, that the Jesuit has. You know, the, 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 the Pope of Rome had, had, has not hidden his intention, had not hidden his intention when Francis became Pope, he sought to establish an economic alliance between Baptists, Evangelicals, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Church of England, the Anglican Church, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Lutheran bishops had actually came to a, an ecumenical agreement and an ecumenical alliance with, with the Pope of Rome. So, so these are indicators that the same intent that the, that the Jesuits had at the time of the Protestant Reformation, at the time of Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Knox, John Calvin, you know, at the time when Ignatius of Loyola founded the Counter-Reformation movement, the same intent that the Jesuits had to destroy the Protestant Reformation and for world domination still exists today. Still exists today. They, th that organization and that body of men who have sought, who are conniving and cruel, who, have, who, who tortured dissenters, who burned them to the stake, who did inquisitions and all kind of, of, of planned, you know, assassinations of, of, of the opposers of the false doctrines of Rome. Those very same individuals are prominent today and even much more prominent because their chief, it, they're, 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 you could say their chief inquisitor, their chief promoter, their chief administrator is the Pope of Rome because he is a product and a son and an appointee of the Jesuit order. So there is, there is no different with their intent from the time of the Protestant Reformation and of their intent today. It's the same. 
That's, that's why the Pope has become so busy, extraordinarily busy, to form ecumenical alliances between even Jewish and Muslim faith leaders, even between Jewish and Muslim faith leaders, to form an ecumenical alliance and a one world religion. That is his intent. That is their intent is to establish Roman Catholic dominance, Roman dominance throughout the world and to be in charge of the world and to enforce a national Sunday law, which will come into existence soon to legislate by force a national Sunday law. The, 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 the Laudato Si encyclical that was written by the Pope outlines his intent to have a day of worship. This day of worship within Laudato Si, which is the Pope's encyclical written by him recently, a few years ago, is really an intent to, 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 to establish a national Sunday law. A national Sunday law with, you know, under the pretext of promoting climate change, you know, of, of promoting the, 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 you could say the proliferation or the spreading, or you could say the getting out of hand of the uncontrollable climate changes that have been happening, the disasters, the tornadoes, the storm, the earthquakes, from the point of view that the world needs rest and the world is stressed, and, and, but the pretext is to really establish a false day of worship. That is the Pope's intent, to establish a false Sabbath, the false day of worship, which is Sunday, Sunday that was established by Constantine the First, and a Catholic emperor of Rome in the fourth century of the fourth century. The changing of the Sabbath day has, has not gotten as much traction as it should, and the reinforcement and reaffirmation of Sunday worship is being peddled to be done through legislation. And the intent is to have Sunday worship legislated through the halls of the Congress of the United States in Britain, Germany, France, and the most prominent countries of the world. Daniel 7.25 said that this beast power, which is, is symbolized by Rome, had a the, the fourth beast that had 10 horns, 10 prominent horns on its top of its head, and one spoke great words against the Most High, and wore out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand unto, till a time and time and the dividing of times. So you see, the prophet Daniel saw in his dreams, what would have taken place against the saints of God. And stated in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 that this beast power, this beast power, this great dragon-like beast with ten horns on its head and a prominent horn that spoke blasphemy against God, which Rome does because Rome assume the throne of God. Rome assumes to, to give forgiveness of sin. Rome peddles the, the forgiveness of sin for cash in the form of, of indulgences. So in that regard, Rome has blasphemed the name of God. So, so the fulfillment of that prophecy was that Rome sought to put its place, the Pope has taught to put himself in the place of God Almighty. 
So that's where the blasphemy has occurred. Because there is only one mediator between God and men, I repeat, the man Christ Jesus. That's what the Holy Scripture said. So, so you know, this battle that's going on between Christ and Satan, the great controversy, is for worship. And Rome is seeking worship because Rome sees itself as above the scriptures. The church of Rome and the Pope sees themselves as above the scriptures and can change it if they want to. I dare them, but they, you know, they, they will say they want to change even the, the Holy Scriptures. And to a certain extent, they have changed, succeeded in changing because they have boasted that they have changed the, 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 the Sabbath, day of worship to Sunday, an act of which there is no scriptural authority according to the Catechism. An act of, the, 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 according to them, the, 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 the church has sensed its power of authority to do so. So it has done so. And it has done so. It is the only act that they have done in which all churches and church leaders are in agreement with them. That is what they stated in their catechism. Go and read for yourself. Study for yourself. So there's a time that is coming for you. There's a time that is coming for you where you will have to decide between the, the bowing down to the beast and this false religion and false day of worship and the, the worship of the true Sabbath day of, of the Lord. Even today, you are pressed to that realization. You are pressed with that information to make a decision between the worship of God and the worship worship of men, of a man. Let me let me go on. You know, let me go on to 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 to, to read some excerpt. You know, according to the book. History of the Reformation of the 16th Century. This is a book that was written by J. H. Merle de Abney. J. H. Merle de Abney. This is what he wrote, and this is the 16th, written in the 16th century. It says Luther was still a true son of the papal church and had no thought that he would ever be anything else. In the providence of God, he was led to visit Rome. He pursued his journey on foot, lodging at the monasteries on the way. At a convent in Italy, he was filled with wonder at the wealth, magnificence, and luxury that he witnessed, endowed with a princely revenue. The monks dwelt in splendid apartments, attired themselves in the richest and most costly robes, and feasted at a sumptuous table. With painful misgivings, Luther contrasted this scene with self-denial and hardship of his own life. His mind was becoming perplexed. So you know how they lived and the hypocrisy with which they lived while the peasants and saints suffered and they, they, they enriched themselves and lived like big shots in those days is similar to what a lot of these these false teachers of today do, you know, these you call prosperity gospel preachers that enrich themselves fat and rich while their poor members suffer, you know, it's similar, it's a similar thing they did in, in uh, Martin Luther's day and it really turned, upstirred his stomach, turned him away from that organization and how it does business. It was a big turnoff for him, to put it in plain language. You know, it appears that wherever Martin Luther 
turned in the Catholic Church. He saw corruption and all types of sins. He stated, no one can imagine, he wrote, what sins and infamous actions were committed in Rome. They must be seen and heard to be believed. They are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. It is an abyss whence with every issues and every kind of sin. This is taken from the history of the Reformation of the 16th century by J.H. Merle de Abney. You know, so there are people like this who have documented the story of Martin Luther, who documented the story of the church at that time, and that were not impressed at all by their evils with the face of a church, with the face, with pretending with, to be the face of Jesus Christ, but having the heart of the devil, of a devil. You know, these writers were not in, at all impressed with, with the goings on within, within that church, so-called church. Luther did not have much that he could, could complement the church with. In 1517, that was why in 1517, he nailed his 95 thesis to the door of the church in Wittenberg's castle, church in Germany against the wrong of indulgences of salvation of works and not by faith. The selling of indulgences for the forgiveness of present, past, and future sin. This is an abomination unto the Lord and is opposite Bible teachings and cause an opposite response by the zealots of the Catholic Church, a counter-reformation movement of what we now know to the as the formation of the Jesuit order of the priesthood. You know, the main reason for the formation of the Jesuit order was a counter-reformation. You know, as, as we have stated, it, it was the counter, the, the protest that the, 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 um, the, 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 the reformers were engaged in. It's to counter the reformation in which the reformers were engaged and to sabotage and destroy the reformation movement. You know, this is this Jesuit, so called Jesuit oath, is documented in the National Library of, of Australia and the National Library of Congress. So the, these are things that people like John Adams, the second president of the United States, and other people who are interested to know know about the activities and intent of the Jesuit order. This is what, what is, is their oath. And I'm going to read from start to finish the Jesuit oath. I now in the present, and this is, I'm sure that the Pope, the Pope, Pope Francis, on becoming a Jesuit priest and belonging to that order before he became a a bishop, a cardinal, and the Pope, he must have sworn to this oath. And the oath states, I now in the presence of Almighty God, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael, the Archangel, the Blessed Saint John the Baptist, and my ghostly father, the Superior General of the Society of the Jesuits, founded by, by Saint Ignatius Loyola, do by the womb of the Virgin swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ Vice Regent. Think about that. Vice Regent, <laughs> a man like such as those people were a Vice Regent of Christ. Think about that. Swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ Vice Regent and the true and only head of the Catholic Universal Church, I do now renounce and disown any allegiances due to any 
heretical king, prince, or state, named Protestant or liberal, or the obedience of any of the laws of our magistrates or of officers. I do further declare that the doctrine of the Church of England and Scotland and the Calvinists, the Huguenots, and others of the name of Protestant or liberal to be damnable and themselves to be damned. <laughs> so you hear, These are, this is strong language. And who will not form, say, the idle further promise and declare that notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propagation of the mother church's interest. So he's saying that he is even willing to be an heretic, an heretic, as some people say, for the purpose of the of, of, of promoting the values of his mother church. To keep secret and private all her agents, counsels from time to time as they interest me and not divulge directly or indirectly by word, writing, or circumstances, whatever I do. Furthermore, promise and declare I will, when opportunity presents, make the wage, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics or heretics, Protestant and liberals, as I'm directed to, extirpate them from the face of the earth. So you see, these people are dangerous people and were dangerous and still are dangerous people. You know, they still are because they're intent, because of their intent, you know. And I will spare neither age, sex, or condition that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive those infamous or infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of the women and crush their in infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate or annihilate their exor exorable, inexorable race. So, you know, I re I'll repeat that. I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury those infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of the woman, and crush their infant's head against the walls in order to annihilate their ex inexorable race. And when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup. The strangling cord is also one of their methods. The steel of the poignard or the or leaden bullets, <laughs> even by a gunshot, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the persons. So where you go against papal authority and you go against, you know, this order or go against the papal agenda. You are a candidate for murder. Basically, that's what they are saying here in their Jesuit order. And they will do so by any means, including all of the horrible means I just mentioned because it's written in their oath and a copy of it is within the Library of Congress and the National Library of Australia. I at any time may be directed by any agent of the Pope or the superior of the Holy Father of the Society of Jesus, in confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and my corporal powers. And with this dagger, which I now receive, I'll subscribe my name written with my blood in testimony thereof. And should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, rip my belly open 
and sulfur burn therein and all the punishment that can be inflicted on me on earth and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. In testimony thereof, I'll take this most holy and blessed sacrament of the Eucharist and to witness the same further with my name. Written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of the Holy Covenant. You know, you know, it's hard to really digest what I'm reading, but I'm sure you are now seeing what the Protestant reformers were up against. They were up against extremely dangerous people and it is gonna come to the forefront again in the time of the end. In the time of the end, it will come to the forefront again. You know, time is against us. So, so you know, because there, there is, there, there is much that could be said, but the, 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 the uh, a continuation is in order. A continuation of, of, is in order. The book, The Great Controversy, in which Ellen G. White goes into, you know, much more detail about the Protestant Reformation in, in about 14, 14 chapters or 14 references about Martin Luther and his activities in the Protestant Reformation. You know, God, all, all those are available. Did God know that his people will go through this kind of persecution? Matthew 5, verse 10 to, to 12 states, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in the kingdom of heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So Matthew is here telling of a prophecy. In, in, and also telling you that the prophets before you were persecuted. So you have to taste to partake in this cup. In this cup, you will also have to be a participant. The time will come for some of us to partake of that cup. There are countries now where Christian believers cannot practice their faith openly, such as China and Russia. You know, you have to be a Christian of the chain church, puppet state church. You know, you can't be a, a Christian openly, a Protestant. There's no such accommodation of freedom of worship in these countries. You know, uh, Revelation in the, you know, 17 especially, you know, speak of the woman. A woman is referred to as, our, as referred to as the church in prophecy. You, if you read Revela the book of Revelation 12, the, Revelation 12 spoke of a, a pure woman and that pure woman, you know, was beautiful, pure woman adorned with stars and, and the sun and, and so forth. And also that the dragon was wrought with the woman, with that woman, which symbolizes his church. So in Revelation 17, a woman also symbolized the false church. You know, Revelation 17, verses 3 to 6. So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the name of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet-colored decks with the 
gold and precious stone and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the oath of the blood of the martyrs of, martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So John saw this woman who was drunken with the blood of the saints. This woman is the Roman church because that's the only church that is responsible for the blood of the saints, for the murdering of heretics during the dark ages, during the time of the reformation movement, the suppression of the reform movement and the burning to the state for the persecutions, the inquisitions, the crusades, conversion by force is the language of the Jesuits and the Jesuit order. Revelation 18, and after these things I saw an angel came down from heaven, having great power and the earth was lighting with his glory. In verse two, and he said, and said, and he cried mightily with, with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine and the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Spiritual fornication. The kings of the earth and the churches have committed spiritual fornication with her by uniting with her in an ecumenical movement. They have tossed aside their true teachings and doctrines of the Bible and have embraced the, the, the Roman Catholic Church and its false teachings. They have embraced the false teaching of the, that woman, of the harlot woman who prostitutes religion for cash. That is why it's called the mother of harlot because it prostitutes the gospel and sells it in the form of indulgences for cash, a form of spiritual prostitution. So it is the hereby called the mother of our lots. And those are the things that Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Knox, John Calvin, Huss and Jerome, and all these great leaders, those are the things for which they were persecuted because they oppose those things. You know, uh, let us conclude now. We're going to conclude by reading a part of Revelation 13. Revelation 13 verse, from verse 1 to 3. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? And who is able to make war with him? Revelation 18 verse 4. Tell, warns us to come out of this beast power, this fallen religion. Come out of her, my people, that he, re that he receive not of her sins and of her plagues. Come out of her, my people, that he partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18 verses 4. You know, in, 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 the, the, in Revelation 13, verse 15, it says, And he had power to give unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak 
and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So Revelation is prophesying the legislation of, of, of the, uh, the National Sunday Law and those who seek to oppose it will be killed. Will be killed. The passage of a National Sunday Law would put the, the true believers of God on the opposite side of papal authority, the opposite side of the, of the Jesuit order and their intent for world domination and world conquer, conquer and rulership. It will put us on the opposite side. So the people of God will be persecuted. The people of God will be persecuted for their beliefs. And some of the people of God will be killed. A, a death sentence will be passed on the centers who oppose, who are in opposition to the national Sunday law. This is explained in Revelation 13 verses 15. But let us conclude now. At this moment, let us conclude rather. We have gone, you could say, greatly gone over our time. We have exceeded rather our time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we study the Protestant Reformation, let us understand the powers of darkness and the forces of evil that surrounds us. And that we can excel and that we can be strong because thou hast said in thy words, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers in Ephesians 6, against the rulers of darkness in this world and against spiritual powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Lord, we are aware that we are battling a battle against spiritual wickedness and that we need you and your power because with your power, we can do anything and we ought not to fear and must never fear any power because there is no power on earth that is more powerful than you are. There is no power on earth that exceeds your almighty power. Lord, because your kingdom will be a kingdom that will come according to, to Daniel chapter 2, Lord. Your kingdom will come in the form of a great stone and will crumble and crush all other kingdoms of this world and set up a kingdom of eternal glory, a kingdom that is eternal and everlasting, a kingdom in which the saints will dwell with you for eternity. Cleanse us, all, Lord, from all sin, and let us prepare to dwell with you in that eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I thank you for your attentiveness. I thank you for your, your patience as I go through this presentation today. And thank you for subscribing, for liking, sharing and promoting this video. Until next time, may God bless you abundantly. Amen. Hello fans. Thank you for watching this video, and remember to please subscribe, like, share, and promote this video to your friends and family. Until next time, please have a wonderful day.